Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and, uh, and I wel uh, welcome you back to a continuation of this series on the Sonship of Christ with our dear brother Anthony Rogers. Today, we're going to take a survey through the Gospel of John in terms of how the Sonship of Christ is demonstrated to us. And as always, we want to welcome our dear brother. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much, brother, for being here with us. Last time, you took us through the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, today, you're going to walk us through John's Gospel when it comes to the Sonship of Christ. So I'll take it away from here. Yeah, and of course, in the case of the previous episodes, we are being quite brief, and that's certainly true when it comes to John. We don't have anywhere near enough time to cover the full range of what John says on this topic. So we'll just touch a few high points. Uh, of course, John's gospel opens in the prologue by identifying Christ as the Word. And it's clear that this is a title for a divine person. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So he's distinct from someone who's God. And then it says the Word was God. Even though distinct personally from another who is God, he is not a different God. He is himself God. He possesses the same nature as the one he's with. Later in the context, we learn the one he's with is the Father. And so it won't be surprising if the Word is also identified as the Son. But this is then going to point up the fact that his Sonship is a divine Sonship. If, the, if it's the Word who's the Son, well then uh, it, the Son is divine. And by the way, since I've said it this way, note the analogy between these two things. The word of a person is not ultimately separable from a person, right? It, it, uh, a word is what reveals a person. In fact, it's the chief way by which we are able to reveal ourselves to others. Well, in this case, John is speaking of God having a personal word, so he, and, and a person's word comes from himself. Well, that's the same kind of idea that you have in a father-son relationship. A son is of his father. Right, And so just like the word proceeds from a person, so the son proceeds from the father and is the perfect revealer of the father. But we really see this as we get to verse 14, where it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father. Right. So here, clearly, it identifies the father as the one he was with, but it's also identifying him as the word, as the Son. In fact, it uses the phrase only begotten, indicating that this is something that's true of him alone and is not true of anyone else. Uh, and by the way, this very language harkens back to the Old Testament, where it speaks of God instructing the people of Israel to construct a tabernacle in which he would dwell. And then in Exodus 40, when the construction was completed, we're told that God came and dwelt in the tabernacle. His glory descended and filled the tabernacle. John's language here is taken right out of the Old Testament. Literally in Greek, it says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. No Jew would have heard this and missed the implications of it. Uh, then later in verse 18, you have the word for only begotten used again, it says, no one has seen God at any time. The God, the only begotten, who's in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So again, he's called only begotten, but here, God, the only begotten. So he is at once identified as divine and given a personal divine designation of sonship. So clearly, John's gospel teaches that Christ, as the Son, is a divine person. In a previous episode, you and I both looked at John 5, where Jesus, in claiming to be the son of the Father who does whatever the Father does, so irked and agitated the Jews that they wanted to kill him. And the explanation given is because in calling God his own Father in the way that he was, he was making himself equal with God. So we'll, we can refer people back to that previous episode to hear about that. Uh, but let's, let's look also at John 10 in connection with the prologue. This is also something you briefly mentioned in a previous episode, but uh, here uh, in John 10, remember that Jesus has just gotten through speaking about uh, himself as the good shepherd, of the fact that he gives life to the sheep, and has said that nobody can pluck the sheep out of his hands. He says the sheep hear his voice, he gives them eternal life, none of them will perish, nobody can snatch them out of his hands. Then he says, nobody can snatch them out of the Father's hands. 
So he said something about himself and the father that's identical, right? Nobody's able to pluck the sheep out of my hand. Nobody's able to pluck them out of the father's hand. And then he says, I and my father, we are one. We are one. Now, he's not claiming that they're the same person, but he is claiming that they have an identity of nature. That's right. And that's pointed up in the Greek. That's right. And that's absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what happens in the context, as you know, is the Jews are so enraged at this that they want to stone Jesus. And, and we're told exactly why they want to stone him. Uh, they said uh, they want to stone him for blasphemy because he, being a man, is making himself out to be God. So if anybody would understand what Jesus was saying in light of a Jewish understanding derived from the Old Testament and uh, the, the theological understanding of, of the Jews, it would have been the Jews, uh, the people that were standing there right in front of him. And it's clear as people reflect on the episode itself that Jesus does nothing to refute this. He doesn't deny that he is the Son of God or that he's making a divine claim here. Uh, in fact, that's obvious because the Jews try to kill him even after he, he speaks to them, right? It says that they still were seeking to, uh, to seize him and he eluded their grasp. Um, but it, uh, Jesus' answer uh, is, is somewhat enigmatic to people, but, but the main point here is that in calling himself the Son of God, he's identifying himself as God. That's what the Jews understood, and Jesus does nothing to disabuse them of that idea. He does reject the idea that he's blaspheming, but not because he's not making a divine claim. He's right. not blaspheming because he's making a true statement. It would only be blasphemous if it weren't true. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one, one final text we can bring out from John is actually found at Christ's trial. And here it's important to realize that the Old Testament had certain uh, crimes that were punishable justly by the civil magistrate. Uh, they, you know, the civil magistrate was allowed to execute people if they committed certain crimes. And that's uh, not a given, right? You can't just execute somebody. Uh, you have to have divine warrant or else it's murder. So the civil magistrate had to be very careful to only implement those penal sanctions that were authorized or ordained by God. So the Old Testament had a number of things for which uh, a person could be put to death without the executor incurring guilt. And uh, among those laws, there's nothing in the law that says that a person could be put to death for claiming to be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. We know throughout first century Israel that many people claimed to be the Messiah. They weren't put to death for it. Uh, they might they might have died at the hands of the Romans for being insurrectionists and, and starting riots and and other things, but that wasn't because the Jews said this man is guilty of blasphemy because he claimed to be the Messiah. The only way a messianic claimant would be charged with blasphemy is if his claims to be the Messiah went beyond merely the claim to be a son of David and mounted up to that other sense of messiahship that some Jews were anticipating, uh, namely that of a heavenly Messiah. And we actually see that in John 19. In John 19 at Christ's trial in verse uh, 6, it says, So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to, him, uh, to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Mm -hmm. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. That's notice, right. notice that it's considered blasphemous. So it's not he's not just claiming to be a creature of God. There's not nothing blasphemous about that. He's not claiming merely to be a, an adopted or redeemed son of God. There's nothing blasphemous about that. And he's not merely claiming to be a Messiah, son of David, and son of God in that sense, because that wasn't a capital crime. It wasn't considered blasphemy. The claim to be the son of God is clearly being understood here by the Jews in a divine sense. In fact, the language here actually is identical to the language found in John 10. Mm -hmm. Remember when the Jews said, it's not uh, uh, for a good work that we're stoning you, but for blasphemy, 
because you being a man make yourself out to be God, right? Here it says, because he made himself out to be the son of God. Mark or John is clearly uh, relating these incidents. This right. is how the Jews understood Christ's claim to sonship. It was a claim to deity. And so again, the Bible's witness is clear to be the son in the sense that Jesus used the phrase was to be a divine person. This is stated in the synoptic gospels. It's stated in John's gospel. And we're going to see it's also stated elsewhere in the New Testament. Absolutely. And I like that, uh, uh, you know, section from uh, John's gospel, chapter 19, because initially uh, it was blasphemy, but they were in a pickle. They cannot really take him to Pilate to crucify him over blasphemy. He can care less about that. So they said he was doing evil things against Caesar, obviously, meaning like he was a political, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a rebel. rebel, if you wish. And, uh, and then they revealed the real reason when they said that statement that you brought up. It's really because he said he's the son of God. And obviously, Mark's gospel amplifies it in Mark chapter 14, verse 61, when the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the most high? And Jesus says, I am. And he added even more, you know, to it from, uh, you know, uh, Psalm 110 and from Daniel's and so on and so forth. Yeah, and it's interesting here, uh, the way you put that, and I absolutely agree. What's interesting is normally people pretend that, well, John's gospel has this higher Christology, but not Mark. We've already looked at Mark, but notice, as you said, or especially your viewers hopefully will notice this, that in Mark, you, you even have it heightened in a sense. It, mm -hmm. it, Mark draws attention to what Jesus said to the high priest, right. explicitly answering a direct question, are you the son of the blessed one? Right. Right. So... John does indicate that Christ is the Son. He's clearly using it in a divine sense. That's how the Jews understood it, too. Uh, but he doesn't include this portion of what happened. So Mark ends up highlighting this in a way that even John doesn't, which is, is remarkable in light of how some people try and water down or present a reductionistic view of, of what Mark teaches. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you so much as always. Thank you everyone uh, for watching. And also we wanna thank you in advance for your anticipated comments and also interactions with us. Uh, send us any suggestions. If there is any specific uh, topic uh, that we address in these episodes and you would like for us to elaborate further on that, the beauty of doing live streams is we can take some of these comments and me and Anthony can take a stab at those and expand further again. Uh, we're just doing a brief summary right now. Lord willing, we can expand on that either through a live stream or future uh, series on this important topic about the Sonship of Christ. So, thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.